Hey there, and welcome back to RimWorld. My name is Pete, and today we complete episode 10 of our RimWorld series with the Cult of Jinx. And before we jump in, we have a small change to announce. At the end of the last episode, I asked you guys what you would think about adding one or two of the vanilla expanded mods to spice up the early travel portion of the series, and well, your feedback was overwhelmingly positive. As a result, I have decided to add the Vanilla Factions Expanded Vikings mod to this playthrough, but for now that remains the only one. Its main purpose is to add a few new armors and weapons, but I want to be very clear about this, my intention is not to make the game any easier or to alter too much of the vanilla gameplay. As a result, I have not added any of the new Viking clan factions, we are also not using its own new storyteller, we also won't touch the new beekeeping feature for now, and overall I will try to stay away from anything that deviates too far away from the vanilla experience. In short, you will see a few new weapons and armors, and perhaps one or two new furniture items, but other than that, the changes should not be too noticeable. With that being said, the Vanilla Expanded team is doing an amazing job and my decision to include as little as possible from their work is certainly not meant as a knock on their efforts. On the contrary, after digging into the list of Vanilla Expanded mods a bit more, I am really itching to play a more heavily modded series at some point in the future, but I would say that's a discussion for another day. I just wanted to get this out of the way so that you all know what to expect, and with that I think we can get going. Last time we left off, after a good and a not-so-good development, yes, we have our first couple of the series in Thoraya and Maniac, but we were also betrayed by our temporary colonists Karen and Connor. After taking them out, we are now back down to four colonists, however, with two prisoners already in the recruitment pipeline. One of them, Redini, is actually already a member of our colony, and she is only imprisoned as a result of a social fight, which we are now using as a convenient excuse to convert her to the Cult of Jinx. Speaking of which, using Spex's conversion ability, we can now also move Coco a bit more in the right direction, but as you can see, she is still not fully convinced. Shortly after then, she also suffers a mental break, and this one is in fact related to her current ideology, which does not like her running around in bright light. From our newly installed mod, we then also receive our first brand new quest, as we are being invited to a Thrombo hunt. These hunting quests are a nice little addition, I think. They come in various forms, although this one is quite a ways away from our base, but then again we also have 21 days to complete it. For now, with the Royal Tribute Collector still running around our small village of Liviana, Maniac finishes the research of recurve bows, and with that, the next two logical choices would probably be the Great Bow and perhaps Smithing. For now though, we have better things to do, namely the construction of a fur bed. Also added by the Vikings mod, this is a nice middle ground between a bedroll and a proper bed. It comes with the added benefit of countering hypothermia, although that is something that shouldn't really matter too much for us, except perhaps for our still naked Thoraya during the winter. It is also not really useful if you want to perform surgeries, but considering the fact that we don't even have a competent doctor to begin with, I don't think that should play too much of a role at this point. The construction consumes both wood and fur or leather, in our case pigskin, and thankfully we have plenty of both. We also once again have Maniac suffering from food poisoning, and things get worse, because on her way back from prison, a Timberwolf starts hunting Specs. Together with Maniac and her burden ability though, we should not have too many issues taking it down. And indeed, there we are, the animal is quickly defeated, and we can watch as another evening slowly sets across the swamp. Before the night fully sets in, we have a combat supplier trade caravan arrive, although once again we probably do not want to tangle with them. Conveniently enough, they do make it over to us, just as Spex is about to head off to bed, and so we can take a quick look at their inventory to wrap up the day. And this time we are in fact purchasing something, some medicine and some Molotov cocktails to be exact, with the latter finally giving us a good way to burn stuff, should we ever need that, in any case it is something that we are currently lacking. You can also see here some of the items added by the Vikings mod, such as the Dane Axe or the Crypto Crossbow, nothing that we need to go into too much detail about at this point, suffice it to say that the mod does also add some options for the late game, but we likely have a few more episodes ahead of us before we get to that. For now, Thoraya also catches food poisoning and then everyone heads off to bed, 
and we can jump ahead to the next morning. Maniac starts his day just like he ended the previous one, with another dose of food poisoning, so he will be slowed down for a little while longer. In the meantime, we are making some slight changes around the village, as we are moving the research bench into Thoraya's and Maniac's bedroom. Just in that moment, we also have a pair of thrombos arrive in the cold bog, and so it seems like we might not even need that hunting quest after all. And while the first trade caravan is now leaving, a second combat supplier is just arriving, and all of that is just perfectly timed, as Specs can now shoot an arrow at the thrombos from the safety of our own walls, and a few seconds later we can watch the carnage unfold. And yes, I am fully aware that this is perhaps a bit of a cheap tactic, and that achieving glory and honor through combat might look a little different in your head, but keep in mind that just because we have the Vikings mod installed does not mean that we have to fight like Vikings. This is the cult of Jinx after all, and as long as people are dying, I think its members are fine with that, no matter how exactly we get to that result. Speaking of which, the fight here is of course only a matter of time. Yes, two thrombos are able to dish out a good amount of punishment, but against two sizable trade caravans with guns, they are hopelessly outmatched. And so we lose a few faction relationship points due to members dying here, but at the end of the day, the two mighty beasts are slayed, and we can help ourselves to their remains. This is also a great example for the usefulness of Spex's water skip ability, which we can now use to extinguish the burning thrombo in one quick blast, and in doing so avoid a potentially lengthy firefighting session. Without refrigeration, we'll have to see what we'll do with all of the meat though. I suspect Coco and Maniac will be quite busy making pemmican for the next few days. For now though, we can quickly assemble the weapons that our poor traders dropped, and then immediately sell them to the second caravan. And yes, a good quality hunting rifle would certainly be useful at this point. However, in terms of damage and accuracy, at least over short to medium range, our two masterwork great bows are actually better. So the added bit of role-playing favor in this case does not lose as much. For the rest of the evening then, we can watch as Thoraya starts constructing a table and a few dining chairs in our common room, which we want to eventually also use as such. Before the work can continue, on the following morning though, we see the next of the new Viking events, as our colonists decide to have themselves a feast. We will however try to ignore that for the most part and force them to continue working, as a feast can last up to 48 hours and can therefore result in a hefty drop in productivity, not to mention the quick depletion of our food reserves. And so Thoraya keeps constructing as Maniac butchers the timber wolf, which is not exactly helping the impending meat bottleneck, as I fear that we will in just a short while have more meat than we can process, at least not before it spoils. So let's get that pemmican production underway as soon as possible, and watch Thoraya reach level 9 in the construction scale. She still manages to botch the construction of a simple wooden chair, but we all make mistakes and we have a bit more wood to spare. Eventually then, four chairs are constructed, one of them even of excellent quality, and with the engraving of a fireball blazing across the sky, possibly that silver meteor that crashed not too far from the base a while ago. Later in the evening then, we finally receive an update on our quest for the Horn of Edmo, it is once again the Empire that contacts us about the artifact, and they even offer to take us to the location of an ancient complex where we might find more information about the Horn's whereabouts. Once we send three of our colonists over there, we will need to hack a few terminals, so if we could, we should send someone with a decent intellectual skill, but unfortunately, after Karen's demise in the last episode, we don't really have that luxury, and Maniac is currently the smartest guy in Liviana with an intellectual skill of 5. However, for now we can't really afford to send three people out anyway, so instead we'll just skip ahead to the next morning. A foggy rain has set in once more as another visitor arrives, just a single trader with a pistol, which brings me to the question at which point we actually want to start attacking other factions. For now, we have been tolerating their presence on the map, and at least in the Empire's case, I think that remains the smart move for the time being, but cases like this are definitely a little bit more intriguing. Perhaps you can let me know what you think about greeting travelers a bit more violently from here on out, but at least for now we'll let the guy live. 
our recruitment plans, then unfortunately experience a bit of a setback as Redini goes into a daze in her prison cell, which could last for quite some time, a few days even, and prohibits us from continuing our conversion attempts, which were actually close to being finished. On the bright side, Thoraya's Gauranlin tree has produced its first dryad, which has immediately entered its cocoon to become a proper medicine maker. Once that process is finished, we will give it a new name, but that will take five days, so we are in no hurry. At least not on that front, our meat situation is getting interesting, however. The butchering of our first thrombo earns us 237 units of meat, and I have my doubts that we can cook all that into pemmican before it spoils, especially if we consider that we need to slaughter that second thrombo soon as well. And so Coco will now continue working at our campfire, which we could actually exchange for a proper woodfield stove to speed up cooking, but for now space is limited and this fits a little better in my opinion. We also receive another quest from the Empire, which I think we can quickly decline, as we will not spare a worker for a week in exchange for any of the rewards here. Instead we can watch as Maniac proposes to Thoraya, and she accepts. So the two of them are certainly progressing quickly, but who are we to complain? You can't always have a love story as complicated as that of good old Edmo. That lone trader meanwhile only receives a muffalo wool parka that we no longer need, and with that the day continues without any major interruptions. Coco keeps making pemmican and improves her cooking skill to level 6. We build a proper double bed for Thoraya and Maniac as well, but other than that there isn't much to report. Early on the next morning then we have to butcher Thrumbo number 2 and shortly after doing so we also detect a steel mining site, likely similar to that woodcutting camp we raided in the last episode. This one however is guarded by 4 people and it also holds 520 units of steel for us in store, perhaps something to take a look at once our two prisoners are recruited. Speaking of which, our young combat specialist here is close to finally seeing the truth, as the next conversion attempt should do the trick and convert him to the Cult of Jinx. And indeed, as we watch Coco and Maniac try their best to reduce our mountain of meat, we receive the info that Spex has successfully recruited another follower. All that is left to do now is to actually recruit the guy to our faction, and looking at his resistance of only 3.8, that should not take too long either. To speed up the cooking process, we are now constructing a second campfire so that Maniac and Coco can make pemmican, but at this point I would also like to know if you think we should build a wood fuel stove. I know I said just a moment ago that I think the campfire fits better, but it is definitely not the most efficient way to cook. The only upside that these longer cooking sessions have is that they help our colonists progress a little faster in the cooking skill, as we can see here with Coco who has just reached level 7. Apart from that though, the day remains uneventful and in the evening Redini is finally over her mental break, so we immediately continue her conversion. One more attempt should do the trick and since Redini is already considered a colonist, we can then simply release her afterwards. And indeed, on the next morning it is time, Spex has one more chat with Redini and finally she decides to convert to the Cult of Jinx. With that, we now release her to have a fifth colonist in our ranks, one with a little eyesight problem, but we'll see how much that actually restricts her. For now, she can equip one of our thrombo horns as a melee weapon and start making herself a wooden face mask, by now pretty much a requirement for our colonists. Her crafting skill of 3 is by the way also the highest in our colony, so until we recruit someone more skilled, most of the crafting work will be done by Redini. After the mask is on, Redini can now make a set of bearskin tribal wear, not for herself, but for our other prisoner, who is currently still completely naked. In the evening then, she can use her social skill of 10 to take over recruitment duties, and we immediately see the difference between her and Spex, as she manages to reduce our prisoner's resistance by 1.3 points, roughly double the amount that Spex was able to get. So down the line, Redini might be a nice candidate for that role of tree speaker that Spex currently holds, but for now we're not going to make any changes on that front just yet. Instead, we can continue to watch as Maniac and Coco try to reduce our meat supply and put Redini's bedroll into our butchering room for now. 
And yes, I know we really need to do something about our storage situation, but at least for today we have bigger concerns. It has been a while, but Liviana is once again under attack. However, I think it speaks to our current situation that I think a group of nine traps people does not pose too much of a threat to us. Now, admittedly, that is in large parts also due to the fact that they are all carrying melee weapons, but I am confident that we should be able to handle this without too much trouble. So with Specs, Maniac and Coco as our archers, we welcome the attackers and quickly cause the first casualties, while Redini and a heavily armored Thoraya are waiting in the back, ready to cover their companion's retreat. This is actually also an unintended advantage of our village-style colony layout. We have lots of small choke points that we can block with just a single person in heavy armor, while our archers have plenty of options to hide behind corners or even retreat into buildings. For this fight right here though, we don't really need any highly advanced tactics, as the first enemy group here is quickly decimated and we can now let our melee fighters take care of the rest. Thoraya holds position while Spex, Maniac and Coco focus their fire on the attackers coming from the north, and a few moments later the traps people are fleeing. We are of course hunting down whoever we can, and in the end I believe only a single enemy manages to escape. As you can see, Thoraya suffered her fair share of injuries, but thanks to the plate armor, nothing life-threatening, and Redini is also quick on the scene with some herbal medicine that we thankfully recovered from our fallen enemies. With a medicine skill of 4, Redini is, once again, the most skilled doctor in our colony, but just like with her crafting skill, we should ideally be looking for a more competent pawn soon. As the sun fully rises on the next morning, only four units of thrombomeat are then rotting away, so despite the nightly fight we did not lose much, in part also because our colonists all had raw meat for breakfast, but as a tribe in the swamp you can't afford to be picky. Since our cultists are all pretty tired, they spend most of the early morning hours in bed, but we can still construct a wooden shelf in Spex's room just to slowly work against the ever-increasing storage issues. Afterwards, we can use Spex's conversion ability on Coco and finally convert her to the Cult of Jinx as well. And with that, all members and prisoners of Liviana are now believers in the Cult of Jinx, and that, I think, is a great foundation to build and develop our ideology upon. In the afternoon, then, we take care of some light repair work, and in the evening, we also send out Coco into the swamp, as a small group of muffalo is currently grazing here. Among them is one female animal, and I think it would be nice if we could perhaps tame it to find a mate for Shadow Mage. For now, Coco's animal handling skill of 11 does not lead to success, but with a 30% chance we'll simply try again tomorrow. Before the day fully comes to an end, we can also do what we can to increase the size of our storage room. It is definitely not much, but the expansion here gives us 5 more tiles of storage space, and with that actually frees up the room next to Spex's. As midnight strikes, we are informed that fall is already here, so temperatures are about to drop again soon. For the time being, though, our roughly 700 units of pemmican should keep us fed for a while. In the early morning hours, Redini then breaks the last bits of our prisoners' resistance, and with that, the actual recruitment attempts can now begin. With a bit of storage space cleared, the bedroom next to Spex's now receives a proper fur bed as well, this one even of excellent quality, so we'll likely switch it for Spex's current one, so that our leader always has the best bed available. This room, by the way, is meant for our latest recruits, who after just one more session with Redini now finally decides to join us. And that means we can give out yet another name, as always chosen randomly from the list of patrons in the naming rights tier and above, and our new combat specialist with a taste for fine cuisine will from now on go by the name Took. I could see him take over the role as hunter and cook of Liviana, with the occasional foray into the arts, but first things first, let's get him equipped. Recurve bow, tribal wear and plate armor, that will be Took's gear for the moment, and in just a second we will also have a wooden mask ready for him. Before we get to that though, we have some more visitors arrive, again with a few items to trade, so perhaps suitable candidates for our first attack. Coco also successfully tames the Muffalo, who will now go by the name of Tina, after patron Tina Sippel. Back in the base meanwhile, Took can put on his wooden mask, and with that we are ready for this quest right here. It is time to send out three of our colonists to find out more about the Horn of Edmo. 
As soon as we accept the quest, an Imperial shuttle arrives and we will now send out Maniac, Took and Rudini to take care of the mission. Maniac goes as our most skilled fighter and as the leader of the operation, while Took and Rudini are sent out to prove themselves, perhaps even to show that they are suitable to take over a more important role in Liviana in the future. And so, as Coco brings Tina and Shadow Mage together for what will hopefully be a long and happy relationship, our shuttle arrives at the ancient complex. We can clearly see its outlines down here below the lake, and I would say we'll end today's episode on this nice little cliffhanger here, and start things off next time with a thorough exploration of the area, and perhaps with some combat as well, depending on what we find inside. For today, let's wrap things up with our usual showcase of lovely fan art, headlined today by another creative interpretation, as Jezago decided not to paint anything, but instead submitted a crocheted version of specs, complete with tattoos, tribal wear, bow and mask, and also some plans in the background. And while we marvel at the talent in this community, which today also includes artwork from Blasphemy and Philly Cheese 7, let me leave you with two questions that I already also mentioned during the gameplay. Number one, would you like us to become a bit more aggressive towards neutral or friendly visitors, possibly resulting in every single faction becoming hostile to us, and with that a drastic drop in the amount of traders we get? And number two, do you think a wood fuel stove would be a worthwhile investment at this point, or do you want us to stick with the campfire for a little bit longer? As always, let me know your thoughts in the comments below, and with that, let us make the cut for today. If you enjoyed the video, then I would be very happy if you could leave a thumbs up, and if you like what I'm doing and want to support me and my channel further, then you can go ahead and subscribe to stay up to date, grab some merch over on shop.peatcomplete.com, or check out and maybe even pledge to the Pete Complete Patreon. Thank you all for watching, and I'll see you next time. Cheers.